All right, welcome everybody to the one o'clock session. Uh, this is the equity conference here at Peralta and you are in session B. This is anti-oppressive pedagogy initiative, a case study. Our speakers today are Dr. Vishnu S. Pandyala and Dr. Michelle A. L. Vieragam. And you will be welcome to leave your questions in the chat for them. And then we will get at the end, a little bit of a conversation happening. Uh, my name is Monica, I'll be your moderator. I'm also your Peralta, uh, one of your Peralta equity trainers. So reach out to me during the session if you have any questions. Otherwise, doctor and doctor, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. We um, first uh, uh, we want to say thank you to everyone joining us for this session, as well as thank you to Peralta for the opportunity to share this content. Uh, this presentation really focuses on a current initiative and one actually over the last three, four years, I would say that we've been working on within our college. Uh, I'm Michelle Villagran and I'm with the School of Information at San Jose State University. And my colleague is with um, the Applied Data Science Department. Both of our school and department are within the same college. Uh, next slide. So before we get into details about the specific uh, initiative or project, uh, I do want to share a little bit about our committee uh, and, and who we are and um, kind of our mission and what, what our goals are. So we are within the College of Professional and Global Education, CPGE, and our committee actually recently renamed uh, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. Uh, it's a committee that is uh, focused on um, valuing diversity for our academic units. So this is a committee that really is associated with our faculty, our students, and our staff. And we address everything related to equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, and as you see here, this is our, our detailed mission, as well as we have several um, purposes around initiatives and what uh, we are doing in our college under the direction of our Associate Dean for Academics. Next slide. So initially when um, the committee uh, was created, which was about four, four and a half years ago, we only had four members. Um, we were pretty small, but we, we started um, doing some work uh, related to a, a literature review and a survey to really learn about anti-oppression and what's going on specific to our two, again, academic units, the School of Information and Applied Data Science. Um, and this activity really fell under where we wanted to go to not just investigate, but find out what can we do next? What are the next steps? Where are we currently at? But what do we need to do next to help our faculty say with their curriculum or to uh, then impact or influence our students? Our committee is now uh, very large. Um, I'm really pleased. I'm chair of the committee and I'm really grateful we have uh, a balance between Applied Data Science and School of Information. Uh, next slide. So to give you context, this is just background and history of the project. Um, it actually really came about one of our members, Dr. Adara Hoffman, um, brought this up as a, a focus that we might want to investigate. It's obviously a, a hot topic within universities and colleges. And the project supports the following goals. Um, initially, we're looking at defining anti-oppressive or what does anti-oppressive mean in our context, um, looking at the strengths and weaknesses within our college when it came to curriculum from an anti-oppressive perspective, as well as um, identifying whether it was faculty, staff, students, what are the needs when it comes to looking at the curriculum to ensure that it's inclusive and anti-oppressive. And fourth, another goal was really to consider resources or maybe what strategies do we need to take towards anti-oppressive pedagogy within the college. So starting in fall 2020, we actually, that's when our committee was formed, uh, we began talking about this and discussing, well, what are the tasks? Where are we gonna start? What do we need to do next? And we decided through just our own conversation on the committee, we really needed to look at the literature and see what was out there. So we conducted a, we did a complete literature review 
focusing on defining anti-oppression and anti-oppressive, what it meant in the context in a university setting, as well as looking at specific literature within library and information science, which the School of Information falls under, and within uh, applied data science or data analytics and looking at the literature there. And then we conducted a survey and this survey went to our full, um, our academic units, so faculty, staff, uh, even students, to understand from them about uh, anti-oppressive education. So what are their experiences within the college, within each of the school or department they're in, as well as in the university context, and what are faculty doing in their classrooms? Uh, and then the curriculum mapping, we didn't do a deep dive into, and I'll talk about that shortly, but I'll let you know what we did do in lieu of that. And then uh, we applied the Peralta um, rubric, the, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, uh, as kind of an initiative, uh, as our 2022-2023 initiative. And right now we're working on a pilot certificate. So many elements that have led up to this big, I would say, certificate that we're currently creating. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to, again, this is historical, but so you just are aware of kind of background. I mentioned the lit review, so I'm not going to give you all, tell you, read that or tell you all of the literature we found, but there's a lot of content out there if you're looking to know about the background related to anti-oppressive education in these two uh, disciplines. Uh, we did conduct a survey, and so I did want to share with you some of the results of the survey. Uh, all of the lit review and the survey data, we ended up creating a, a I would call it a white paper, a uh, report to our college to share our findings and came up with kind of action items. These are the next steps we're going to take. And then uh, that fall, we actually created or had a webinar where we shared the results from our findings. We had 151 participate in the survey uh, and it ran, it was over spring, about three weeks in spring 2021. 76% uh, of the responder were from the School of Information, 23% from Applied Data Science. And that wasn't surprising, I will say, because um, Applied Data Science Department is a smaller program compared to, or smaller department compared to the School of Information. Um, we also asked other demographic questions. So um, everything from marginalized groups, uh, we had 15% that did not identify uh, with the marginalized community, whereas everyone else identified with one or multiple. Uh, and so here's some snapshots related to two main categories that we looked at, which were equity issues and anti-oppressive topics related to, I say, experiences, feelings, or even attitudes towards uh, anti-oppressive issues. And I only have a few screenshots here. I didn't want to give you the whole survey, but just to give some context. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first is, um, and one of the top questions we asked, we wanted to understand what are the top equity issues that participants in the survey um, were thinking about. Like, what are the issues that you're seeing and that are most, most important to you? And from this, I mean, there was racism was number one. We had about 17%, followed by sexism, classism, transphobia, um, ableism, colorism, uh, and the list goes on. Under other, I will say there was ageism, um, linguistics, and then even country, specific country concerns. So this at least gave us some framing when it came to what equity issues um, were of top of mind for the participants. Uh, next slide. Here's just one question. And uh, do you see anti-oppressive education as relevant to your teaching? And faculty, as you can see here, that responded 92% said yes. We had a few say no, and maybe that may have tied with, I don't know, maybe defining it or what it meant, or maybe the courses that they were teaching. Uh, but there's a significant um, importance to our, our faculty that are teaching um, as it related to their, their courses. Next slide. And then uh, we asked you take an anti-oppressive stance in your classroom. Uh, about 83% said yes. Uh, and again, we had you know, some that responded no. Uh, so this was an inclination for us that, okay, so faculty are looking at anti-oppressive education and they're doing something in their classroom. So we need to learn more about what, what's being done or isn't being done. Next slide. 
Uh, and this is a very detailed slide, but it relates to the approaches or even the materials that um, faculty are using uh, to support anti-oppressive um, education in the classroom. And I know it's very small. I even need to zoom in here to see some of these um, topics, but we had, oh, and maybe Vishnu, if you can read like the top one. Uh, the approaches, you mean? Uh, yeah, it looks like there are two top um, choices here and you could choose more than one. Um, I can't see it so small. Okay, so one is uh, acknowledge diversity among students. And the next uh, one is affirm diversity among students. Okay, great. So, yes. and that was what, like 18%? About 18% it looks like. Yeah. Uh, so these were, you know, some, and we we gave them uh, respondents options to choose from to see, you know, what were they doing and how um, are they addressing it in the classroom, and it it really varied across the board, um, and you could select more than one. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also asked, how do you feel um, related to uh, anti-oppression as it's relevant to the professional practice? Because we are preparing students, you know, to go into the real world for the profession. And uh, about 84, 83% um, said yes, they felt that anti-oppression is relevant. Um, and we did have a significant number here that said no. Uh, so again, diving into that further to understand why, or uh, maybe we need to offer some other educational opportunities to learn more. Uh, next slide. Now, again, we involve students to uh, set this out to students um, as well as staff. Um, and this question is specific to students. So do you feel that anti-oppression is relevant to you in your educational experience? And we had about 78% said yes, 22% uh, said no. Next slide. Um, and then also another question, do you feel that your uh, SJSU education is preparing you for questions of social justice or human diversity in the workplace? Uh, where again, about 70% said yes, uh, about 30% said no. Um, so these two questions were uh, answered by students. Uh, next slide. So that's just a snapshot. There are many more questions within the survey, but after doing a full analysis, we realized that we need to take some next steps or next um, action items. And so one of the things we did, and this is where that um, curriculum mapping, which I originally mentioned, um, we wanted to do a full curriculum mapping for all of our programs. But then we realized that's going to take a lot of time and we're a volunteer committee and we already have certain committees and other um, avenues within our schools and departments that do some of the curriculum. Like we have a curriculum committee, right? And then also strategic planning. So we decided we're not going to do a full analysis of every single course and do a full mapping. Instead, our um, Center for Faculty Development, which is a, a university, um, a center uh, for faculty within, our, uh, within the university, um, they have a lot of resources that faculty can utilize. And so we went to them to find out what they can offer us to help support this initiative and what we wanted to build out. And they have several workshops. Um, one of them that's kind of a, a, a one-on-one or a starter is the Reimagining the Syllabus, which really walks you through and has activities where you analyze and examine your syllabus to ensure it's inclusive, looking at terminology, um, and almost like redoing your syllabus at the same time. So we offered two workshops. Um, faculty could attend either a session, it was recorded. And then another resource, um, and this is optional, but another resource um, through the Center for Faculty Development, there's a program called Ideas, where uh, an individual from CFD will come and observe and actually be very integral within your courses. And this is very helpful for face-to-face -face courses, uh, but they do some consultations with you around uh, your teaching and to help you with your uh, actual practices within the classroom. It can also be done for online. Uh, I will say School of Information is 100% online and has been since 2009. 
and then applied data science is uh, face to face. So we have a unique um, aspect with our two units within the college, but offering a variety of options so that faculty can uh, take advantage of any of these resources. Uh, next slide. Um, along the way, uh, actually, and it, we don't have this in the presentation, but I do want to mention there were other colleges within, and there are right now within our university looking at um, similar topics around um, anti-oppressive education, College of Music, uh, College of Engineering, and then uh, Social Sciences, and probably others as well. So others had similar initiatives going on, and we were sharing information with them. And uh, the committee, what we decided is we wanted to um, roll out kind of as a next step, an equity audit or a rubric check for faculty. So they can go through you know, a checklist and review their own courses. We utilize the Peralta equity rubric on each course. Um, and we tested this as a committee. Uh, so we swapped, we reviewed two courses of each other's and gave feedback. And what we offered to faculty, because that took a lot of time, um, what we offered to faculty was here's the checklist, here's the rubric. Uh, we actually created um, almost two different rubrics, one for on site and one for online. We took the already established one and then modified it so that we would have both. So both of our uh, School of Information, which is online, could utilize the one, and then the Applied Data Science could utilize the on site um, rubric. And then we um, encourage faculty to do this on their own as an exercise and then conduct a self reflection um, around their review and you know take some action to make changes if they felt it was necessary. Um, and I know we surveyed two faculty to get some feedback and see if it was beneficial. I know as a committee, we were very vested in it and thought it was a, a valuable exercise. But this was again voluntary and um, shared with our faculty as kind of a next step in the process. Uh, next slide. So this leads to kind of the meat, I would say, of the presentation and where we're at today and what we're working on. Um, we asked faculty to rank, you see these five topics here, if they could rank uh, which they thought was most important or what they wanted to really look within their courses and find out more about, or maybe some more education. Um, and all of them came up as critical. I don't think one was more critical than the other. However, if we went back to the initial survey a year before, a year and a half before, um, racism was a hot um, equity topic um, that those were interested in. So we took that and expanded the list. Um, we looked at the College of Social Science, um, talked with some of the other colleges and the work they were doing and decided that we would pilot a certificate. So um, this is where we're at right now, creating a certificate, and it includes a $500 stipend if you complete um, so many modules within the certificate. It is 100% asynchronous on Canvas. Um, you also get an actual certificate and a badge. And I'm gonna transition uh, to my colleague Vishnu, who will talk further about the structure of the processes and what it entails. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was a very good introduction. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, certificate course is similar in structure to the other uh, professional development courses offered uh, to the faculty at uh, San Jose State University. Uh, <clears throat> the, like Michelle said, uh, it's uh, asynchronous online. We use the learning management system Canvas to offer the course. And the participants are guided uh, by video lessons, reading material, and uh, feedback from the instructors. Uh, <clears throat> there are um, uh, several modules. Uh, one of the modules could ask the participant to create a five minute lecture to be used in their course, um, and also create captions by using Canvas Studio. There's a feature called Studio on um, Canvas. Or they could also use YouTube, uh, but the idea is to create captions. So that is uh, one assignment um, in one of the modules. Another assignment could ask uh, to review their uh, syllabus 
and uh, other documents they provide in the class for uh, gender binary language. <clears throat> so after the review of these documents, um, the participants uh, who are all faculty members are asked to revise the documents to include gender inclusive language. Uh, <clears throat> a third assignment could ask to create a plan for uh, how they might respond to student concerns of well-being. The concerns could be stress, trauma, food insecurity, and so on and so forth. So in the plan, uh, the participants are asked to include how they will address concerns of well-being in their syllabus, in the classroom, during one-on-one -on -one conversations, in the, during the office hours, so on and so forth. Um, so as a committee uh, that uh, Michelle mentioned in one of the first few slides, we are trying to test this course by ourselves first and then rule it out uh, by August, which is the beginning of uh, fall uh, to others. So this is the draft syllabus. Um, uh, the learning objectives, the course learning objectives, CLOs, are to comprehend principles and methods of teaching and learning that promote equity, diversity, inclusivity, and social justice. The second CLO is uh, to create course materials that align with equitable and inclusive course design. A third CLO is to recognize suitable student support mechanisms for a particular course. And there's also a CLO to recognize inequalities and formulating strategies to address them in specific courses. So like I mentioned, there are uh, assignments uh, throughout the modules. Some of these assignments are discussions some of them are written assignments. Then there are some hands-on exercises and then uh, review. So uh, this is a list of uh, some of the modules, actually all the modules um, that are in the course. Some of these are mandatory and some are uh, not mandatory. Um, the nine modules cover various aspects of uh, achieving equitable student outcomes, such as uh, gender inclusive and anti-racist pedagogy, accessible education, equity concerns in virtual and face-to-face -face environment, and so on and so forth. So with the pandemic came uh, uh, the virtual classes. So there are some issues with virtual classes, equity issues particularly. So we wanted to address those as well in the modules. So these are the nine modules. Um, so a, free, uh, a few screenshots from the draft Canvas course for the certificate. Uh, as can be seen, uh, there's material to read, videos to watch, and discussions to participate in throughout the semester. Um, so there's discussion after module completing module one. Uh, there's uh, uh, <clears throat> there's some reading material if you see on the right. Um, and uh, there are some videos to watch and so on and so forth. So for the for seeking participants, we created a Google form uh, that uh, the prospective participants need to fill. So the form asks some pertinent details such as past experiences with equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, the current courses that are being taught by this particular uh, participant, and uh, which specific course will be used for revisions that the equity course requires to be made. I mean, we talked about this, um, the, the course that we are trying to offer 
requires the participant to make some changes um, to make sure that uh, the equity concerns are addressed. So we want the participants to uh, list the course or courses that they would like um, uh, to make changes to as part of this course. So, um, so those are some of the questions that uh, the participants need to answer on this form. And based on these answers, uh, we, we would be selecting the participants to participate in the course. So we are still sorting out the details. Um, some of the aspects that still need to be addressed are listed here. Uh, so marketing is uh, one uh, major such issue uh, because uh, we want uh, we don't want to leave anyone to be left out. No one should be felt left out. So marketing is very important. Um, then the participation itself. Uh, uh, the pilot for academic year 23-24 is for just 10 participants. Uh, we need to uh, uh, better our criteria for choosing the participation. So we are still working on those details. And that's the participation, participant selection aspect. And then uh, for uh, future years, we need a budget uh, to be planned out. Uh, so that's uh, something also in consideration. And then of course, uh, the course needs maintenance and updating just like uh, any other course. Um, so this is also a very big chunk of work here. So these are some of the details we are uh, still sorting out. So I'll uh, call Michelle back and uh, ask you a few questions. Thank you, Vishnu. I actually wanted to, I thought of another item we need to add to that prior list. Um, one thing is, uh, and we talked about this as a committee, is around like grading, right? Are we actually going to be grading um, assignments as faculty complete them? And I think our decision was no, it's like an honor system. You're going through it and we'll be checking in, but we're not, we're not there as the teacher and going to be actually grading and assessing like you would in a, a classroom. But we will do some check-ins to ensure you know faculty are going through the activities and will be available for them as a committee if they have questions. Um, and then the other thing too I just thought of is about the badge and the certificate. How setting that up will we'll likely work with um, Center for Faculty Development because many of their certificates they already have that established. So just ensuring we have our processes down um, to be able to provide the print certificate or electronic certificate, as well as the badge that then can be put on LinkedIn or wherever faculty wanna share their badge. Um, and I'm sure there's a host of other issues. So we have questions for you and hopefully this will lead to some conversation in our last about 15 minutes where we can um, talk further about this and then questions you might have for us. Um, but these are kind of four prompts and we can just start with the first one. Um, have you been involved with similar initiatives at your institution or organization? And you know, what have the experiences been like? Um, and maybe it was at a former institution. And then if you have any suggestions or recommendations for us and for our, our project, um, I know one of our concerns is with the pilot, um, it's five for the fall, five for the spring. And we were able to get um, funding through our college. And every year I have to put in a um, a budget proposal request to see if we can get the funding. But what if we only get three participants? Or what if we get 20? So that's where like Vishnu mentioned, our criteria is going to be critical. How do we decide? And then what if we have low interest? How, I mean, the $500 seems like it would be pretty um, enticing. Um, and I will say this is open with the pilot. We're opening it for tenure, tenure track and lecturers. It's not open for part-time faculty, but that might be another aspect. Um, hopefully everyone will want to participate and we can you know, broaden it beyond uh, tenure, tenure track or lecturers. 
And then also challenges you may face or concerns you may have faced with similar initiatives. So these are the four questions. And I think, um, Monica, maybe, I don't know if people unmute or how they want to yeah. use chat. Um, if, any comments? If anybody, yeah, does anybody want to respond to Michelle's questions here? If not, I will, but I'll, let me give it a second and see. Well, and I think it might be good at first. Um, has anybody involved been involved with a similar project or initiative um, in your organization? Um, whether it's, you know, your department or like as a whole. I mean, I can go ahead. Obviously at Peralta, we run our equity courses. Um, I will say this the issues that we're having right now and maybe this is everybody right now because across the board low enrollment has been an issue and so funding is a constant concern um right now we're trying to present a sustainable funding model uh it's always oh get it from guided pathways take it from um you know hearst funds cares funds we need something the problem with that is it's great but that means that the university or the college doesn't value this as a permanent project, right? That already tells that to you is that equity is not on their mind or it's not at the forefront. Um, so I do want to say we're, we have the same exact problems right now with, uh, with funding. Um, I would like to suggest, I would recommend that you have somebody actively moderating and grading um, because we did run a course like what you're saying, um, kind of a self-paced course where instructors do not, um, they're not getting graded or not getting feedback. And we ended up with some really, um, how shall I say this politely, just instructors who are going through the motions and just, you know, checking off a checkbox and getting their class pushed into the um, equity, you know, badge. <laughs> um, whereas after we started adding feedback and we started having regularly graded assignments, um, you know, they understood the weight of the practice. I hope that helps. That's great um, input, Monica. We appreciate that. Yeah, we talked about it as a committee, but we kind of were against, I don't know. We'll, we'll, I'll bring that back up to the committee and we can discuss it. Um, other no, no. comments? Um, anyone else that's on the, on the call that has been involved and wants to share? Or you can use the chat too. So there is one comment on the chat window. Uh, Margie Gomez says, uh, I recommend grading and opening it up to adjunct faculty as well. Um, that's a good point as well. Uh, we one, I think one thing with the adjunct or part-time, um, this is a pilot, so we wanna see how it's gonna go the first year. And then, like our, I think our hope as the committee, like we're all vested. We all want to. Over the summer, we're actually going to be participating in it as a test. Um, but we're hoping that all instructors will eventually go through the the certificate. Uh, so eventually, everyone, including our part time faculty. But I appreciate that. I know that um, part time faculty and our, our we call them part time faculty um, would be really interested in this. So thank you for that uh, recommendation. Other thoughts uh, or recommendation or challenges. I think the big one, uh, and Monica, you pointed out your yeah, budget. Um, we're fortunate that um, San Jose is very vested in this. It's part of the um, kind of the strategic plan and uh, transformation, what is it, 2030 or 2025, as well as um, at our like the Center for Faculty Development. They have a lot of their other uh, certificate programs they run um, that touch on some of these aspects and we're just customizing it for our college and our two, um, our department and school specifically. So and Michelle, you have a, oh yeah, yeah, I think you're gonna say it, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so Sarah says, uh, I've been through something similar when I was a high school teacher and uh, it had grading and badges as well, making sure that it had the buy-in. So that's a good point as well. 
Well, and then some of the individuals too that like go through it and because there will be, well, they have to make it, it's an active engaging, like they have to make a change, right? Within their, we'll just say their syllabi, for example. But those, um, hopefully those that go through it, this first pilot, this first round can then become our champions or our cheerleaders or our um, partners that can help do some promotion. Maybe we can get some testimonials from them as well, or whether it's recorded or written testimonials to encourage others to take um, advantage of such a great opportunity that we've we've spent several years really developing. Um, and there's, I see, to make it more sustainable, decreasing the $500 incentive and paying instructors to grade. Oh, that's interesting. We went with the 500 because that's similar to the other certificates that are run through um, Center for Faculty Development. Um, but that's a, a great uh, thought there. I'll make a note of that. And Monica gave us a, a, a formula. Instructors usually receive 500 to teach. Participants that take the class receive 500. But that oh, in the Bay Area, I'm not sure what modules uh, models look like. Yeah, I think we need to probably think about that after. Um, and once, I, I should say too, as a committee, after the pilot, we're going to do some assessment. So we'll be collecting feedback. So then we can actually analyze and determine maybe there's a specific module that doesn't need to be included or maybe we need to add something else or maybe like the whole funding model needs to look differently so there's a question are adjunct faculty included in the certificate options so like uh, Michelle mentioned, I think we are still in the pilot stage. Uh, so initially we want to restrict it to the tenure and tenure track faculty. But I think in the long run, uh, like Michelle said, uh, uh, we might open it up to adjunct faculty. But if your question is with respect to uh, any such certificate courses in uh, uh, San Jose State University, then the answer is yes, because I was an adjunct faculty before uh, becoming a tenure track. Uh, uh, faculty here. Um, so I did attend some courses like the certificate courses at San Jose State University as an adjunct faculty. So the answer is yes. And we could probably change that too. I think given this conversation, we're not locked into that. Um, so we can take that back to the committee and actually back to our uh, associate dean or, uh, to find out if that is um, something we can do, just change in the budget proposal. But so we appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead. So another good uh, suggestion is uh, make faculty submit screenshots or embed code of the changes that they have implemented. So I think that is already planned. Um, in some other courses, similar courses that I took, that's what I did basically. I submitted uh, the document itself, uh, <clears throat> Word document or PDF or screenshot of the changes that I made to the course. And uh, so, yeah, that is um, that is what we do as well. Yeah, and then they can be uploaded too within the Canvas site. Um, yes, that's right. And we did talk about, you know, after the pilot doing just a webinar to share with, and we can record it and bring some of those participants to share their experiences and changes they made. Um, which I think would be really valuable to hear from like actual changes, actual and even impact if they're able to um, measure or show the impact it's had in the classroom. I believe the next question is to the Peralta members. Would you like to take it? Yeah, I'm just reading this. So at Peralta, have there been any efforts to track impacts of faculty participation on subsequent cla um, class outcomes and equity gaps? We just sent out the faculty survey. Um, I would say in the, let's see, we're in spring. So we sent it out at the end of winter. And then we also sent out a student survey and we made sure that the classes that were being um, considered in the sample were ones that have already been run through the rubric. So that's what, what we've done. So we're still waiting to see what the answers are from those. Um, and that's another thing is that you all know about peer online course review, the poker alignment, I don't know if you, the CVC. Yeah, so those have a very high quality 
caliber of alignment. And that's our next one. Our survey is going to be held for those in the summer, but we need a comparison of before and after. So, but yes and no, Jim. <laughs> and, you know, one thing we have at um, San Jose, and this might be all the CSU, but I can only speak for San Jose. We do have an equity, a dashboard, but unfortunately for our to our department, um, applied data science and school of information, the data is not as comprehensive and we can only use that dashboard to a certain extent because the data isn't 100% in there accurate and all of that. Um, but we do have a dashboard where the university is collecting a lot of data. Um, and I know we have that as a resource within one of the modules for faculty to look at. Um, it's just, if you look at your course, then it says you're 100% what I, I mean, then it's like, oh, what changes do I need to make then if I'm 100% everything's fine? So um, I think in the future that will be a, a tool we could utilize, but right now it's um, still an establishment because it's in the beginning or early, um, early stages. Um, and then uh, I see the comment about the grading. Yeah, we have, there's nine modules and we originally had said a completion of six, then you get the badge and then we're going back and forth on do you have to complete the whole series or can you pick and choose? Um, and I think we're still thinking about picking and choosing because not you know every module may be really applicable to specific courses for what that faculty has in mind and where they wanna focus. They could certainly come back to it. I don't think we're gonna kick them out. We'll just keep building on um, who's, um, you know, the participants and who's, they can be kind of mentors for next pilot or next certificates. Oh, and there's, uh, thank you, Vishnu. Vishnu is sharing the um, dashboard I, I mentioned, I believe. So this is the dashboard from uh, Peralta, actually, equity mm -hmm. dashboard that uh, uh, Monica mentioned. So I just yeah, wanted I just wanted I wanted to share it with you and let you know you're not alone because we we have we have this wonderful dashboard, but it still doesn't tell us all the disaggregation information that we really need, right? Um, so it's a good starter, and we keep improving it every year with help of our IT team. But it was only, for example, it just reflected online learning just within the last two years or so. So work in progress, folks. Yeah. I mean, it's a good, like you said, starting point, or at least to even know it's there and available. Um, let's see, uh, let's, can we just go to the last slide? So that way everyone has our contact information and we can of course continue the conversation. Um, but I know Vishu and I would be happy to, you know, uh, talk with any of you afterwards or even share our experiences once we kick off the pilot and see how it goes. Um, or if you have questions or, um, you know, anything, we're happy to continue the conversation beyond today's 45 minutes. Any other comments or questions? I just wanna encourage everyone to please note these emails, take a screenshot, um, you can write to our guest speakers if you have any suggestions or you have questions for them. Also, uh, again, just a reminder, we are going to post this to our YouTube channel. And in case you want to know, we do have social media presence. <laughs> Peralta Online Equity is on Instagram and Facebook uh, and Twitter. Um, we encourage these kind of conversations and all of these models because I think we can learn from each other. I'm really excited to see what San Jose State will come up with. And I hope that you'll at least keep in contact with some of us from the equity team as well. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone today for attending. <laughs> so I just wanted to quickly show the equity portal. Uh, this is very specific to the faculty member. So this is uh, specific to me, but I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, uh, things that can be discovered from the dashboard. Uh, who are your students, 3% underrepresented minorities, so all that stuff. So there's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, I'll probably in the interest of time, I'll not go over everything, but uh, you get the idea. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, 
again, I think we really appreciate your time and for being here and welcome, you know, comments or just to stay connected. And we will definitely stay connected with Peralta. So thank you again to everyone.